My name is uh, Dave Deptula, and I'm the uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace uh, Studies. Uh, joining me as a co-host, we have the uh, editor of War on the Rocks, Mr. Ryan Evans. Now, our topic this morning is the future of air superiority. Over the next decade and a half, the United States is at risk of losing its ability to control the aero domain in combat. Budget pressures have forced delays and in key investments, while our adversaries continue to advance. With this in mind, Brigadier General Alex Grinchewicz led a team of air, space, cyber, and logistics and support experts in an exhaustive review of options to gain and maintain control of the air when necessary. It was called an Enterprise Capability Collaboration Team, or ECCT for short, and it resulted in the Air Force Air Superiority 2030 flight plan. Two of the other key experts of the Air Superiority ECCT were Colonel Tom Coglator, the concept development leader, and Mr. Jeff Sailing, the analysis team lead. We're very pleased that they could join us today to explore this vital mission area. Now, after this study was finished and the flight plan completed, General Grinch wrote a series of four articles on the topic that were originally published by War on the Rocks. They were so well done that I asked Grinch, with the approval of Ryan, if we could combine them into a Mitchell Institute policy paper. It's finished, and we're releasing it here today, so please be sure if you haven't already gotten a copy, get one and read it cover to cover. Now, the way we're going to run the panel today is in a discussion format, with Ryan and I alternating with a few introductory questions, and then we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for uh, audience uh, participation. And before answering their first question, we are going to give the panel members a couple minutes to uh, give a little bit on uh, background and any introductory remarks that they'd like to make. So with that, Ryan, over to you. It's great to be uh, the co-host for this event and thanks to the Mitchell Institute. I just want to say very briefly that when I first started War on the Rocks a few years ago, it, one of the things that was striking was is the Air Force was probably the least active service in participating in public debate. Uh, especially when compared to you know some of the other services, Navy and the Army in particular. And that's really changed over the last couple of years. And uh, this series of articles, I think, played a big role in that. I just want to emphasize how um, unusual it was for a senior leader to write such a sort of rigorous, well-thought-out, original series of articles on this and throw it out against the wall where it was vulnerable to a lot of public criticism. And I just want to commend... Uh, of General Grinkwich for that and thank him for that and, and that it was sort of a part of a wave of much more uh, Air Force public engagement and of course organizations like the Mitchell Institute are really crucial to that so uh, I just want to uh, commend the panelists for being a part of this and for uh, you know sticking your neck out there and, and, and supporting more junior officers to do the same and uh, turn it over to you gentlemen. Great well uh, thanks uh, we're uh, we're excited to be here you know it's uh, it if an idea can't stand up to public scrutiny, then it, it may not be the best idea. So I think that's kind of my philosophy with this and getting it out uh, through War on the Rocks and then obviously through the Mitchell Institute supporting us. I, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to advocate for what we did uh, in Air Superiority 2030. Uh, so, you know, the study is a little bit over a, a year old now, but I think we stand by uh, everything that came up in, uh, in the ECCT's work. Um, there's been uh, some progress on some things in one direction and some progress in other directions on other pieces of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we said as we finished the Air Superiority ECCT was that it would likely be outdated as soon as the Chief of Staff uh, signed on the bottom line. And that's certainly true. Uh, but it's also certainly true that it provided an intellectual framework for us to think about air superiority uh, in the 2030 time frame. Uh, and what I would, I guess I, the way I would frame kind of the, the biggest intellectual outcome of the study is that when we think about air superiority, we don't need to think about fighter jet combat uh, anymore. Uh, we need to think about how it's a network of capabilities that come together in order to achieve that air superiority effect or that condition uh, that you set for the joint force. Uh, and so that is why uh, there's so many different pieces to this, and it really lays out kind of a broader vision uh, for where the Air Force could go in the future if it chooses and if resources uh, stay aligned to this and if there are stable resources over time, uh, then you've really got an opportunity to bring uh, air power uh, of all kinds, space power of all kinds, and uh, cyberspace capabilities to bear uh, in order to set this air superiority condition. If we just think about air superiority as fighter combat, 
uh, then we're probably not going to get uh, where we need to go in the future. So I think that's kind of the bottom line of it, is it's really that integrated network of capabilities uh, that, we, uh, that we would advocate for uh, from the study perspective. Uh, so with that, Jens, did you want to say anything up front? We'll stay down. Okay. We'll sum it up. All right, great. We'll, uh, we'll take questions then. Uh, I guess the first question I'll throw, and then we'll, we're going to bounce back and forth a bit, then we'll throw it out to the audience, is uh, there's a lot that's been said about the Air Force's relationship with autonomy, and one of the sort of common criticisms that you hear is that the Air Force isn't ag is against uh, more autonomy, against more unmanned systems, because it's a service that where fighter pilots play senior roles. I think one of the things that came out in this in this report and the articles that preceded it was that actually is, is kind of an unfair characterization. I'd love to hear the, the three of you comment on that and, and also talk about where you're thinking in terms of air superiority and the role of autonomy. Yeah, I would, I would say we're not against autonomy at all. Uh, it's just how you use autonomy. Uh, and, uh, you know, autonomy, it, it's essentially a technology, and uh, I would start it at a component that level. I think where folks uh, mix the two up is there's a difference between unmanned platforms maybe and autonomy. So uh, autonomous operations can help subcomponents, can help a user make decisions uh, more quickly and uh, eventually you can maybe get to an autonomous uh, vehicle that, that makes uh, decisions uh, in and of itself. So I'll, uh, I'll add just a piece of that from my, uh, my personal perspective on autonomy. Uh, so I, I go back to kind of the concept of a network, right? And so if we're talking about uh, different uh, pieces of capabilities that come together in a networked fashion, uh, from the network's perspective, what does autonomy look like? It looks like the ability of something to operate on its own at certain times without support from the rest of the network. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can do it with a machine providing that autonomy. Uh, or you could do it with uh, some other capability, like the gray matter between the ears uh, of, of maybe me, if I'm ever lucky to fly enough again, uh, providing that autonomy in the network. The, the, the beauty of thinking it, uh, about it like that is you can then start to get away from the emotional arguments about, you know, are fighter pilots uh, going to be around or do we need people in airplanes or not? And you can start to think about it from a capability perspective. What can make the fastest and best decision under those conditions where you need it to be able to operate independently, maybe because information is being denied through jamming or other things uh, toward that platform? Uh, can a machine do that? Or is there enough subjectivity that's going to be required that you need something else? And where is that, where is that trade point going to be? The, the other thing I'd note is that you know, I think it's a little bit of an unfair characterization when we talk about the, uh, the Air Force being against autonomy. It's really a question of where that point of autonomy happens. So uh, back, uh, you know, in the day flying an F-16, uh, the point of autonomy when I first started flying it was about a couple of miles away from an adversary when I was able to shoot a short-range missile at it. That short-range missile, in effect, is an autonomous wingman that's going on a, kami a kamikaze mission to, to hit that target. Years before that, it was a bullet out of a gun. Years after that, it was an AMRAAM, a, a longer-range missile that was that point of autonomy, and you move it back. So we've always been adjusting where that point of autonomy is based on what are the capabilities that we have in, in machine autonomous operations versus human autonomous operations, and where do you, where do you make that, that link happen? And then Riddler's exactly right. The ability to infuse autonomous logic into, a, into an aircraft and pair it uh, in kind of man-machine teaming is really powerful. So the F-22 is a great example of that, where the sensor fusion engine on that airplane brings in a bunch of disparate information together and presents it to a, to a pilot in a way that it's easy to digest. Maybe in the future that doesn't have to be a pilot it's, it's presented to, but, but right now it, it, it does. Uh, but that, without that machine doing that and pulling in all the information from the sensors and making it look like something rational that a human uh, can act on, uh, you wouldn't be where you are. So it's really where the point of autonomy is, I think, that's the, the, the piece of debate that I would focus on. Great. Gentlemen, in the paper and uh, in the air superiority flight plan, one of the topics that you talk about uh, a lot is this whole notion of family of systems. Uh, could you comment a little bit and uh, provide a little bit more definition uh, uh, for the audience in terms of what you're talking about when uh, you describe family of systems? 
Yeah, so Bam Bam, you want to take that one for uh, starters? I mean, from an analytical perspective, I think we've got a good basis for how we pulled that together. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically when you're actually thinking about the uh, family of systems, you actually have to look at the capability that you're actually trying to produce in the battle space. So when when you look at things in isolation, especially analytically when you look at them in isolation, you can, you can see how one thing performed against another 1v1. But what the complex problem that we're, we're trying to get into for the future is, is how the evolution of the IATs is, has occurred. So essentially a dense, thick, overlapping, multispectral environment where there's a lot of entities operating in concert with other entities in that. Be able to produce an effect in, into that uh, air, area, airspace, or any, any space that you want to try to produce an effect, you need to actually be able to operate in concert with all the other entities in that, in that environment. So uh, when we looked at uh, all the various capabilities and we did analytically looked at those things, we saw benefits of various uh, technologies, various uh, ideas and concepts, but then when you put it into that dense environment, you ha they have to be able to work together. And so when uh, that became readily apparent throughout the course of the year that to operate in that environment, you need them operating in concert with each other such that they can be able to produce an effect in that environment. Yeah, so the. Uh I think that's exactly right. It, what I what I tie it back to, and the reason you so a family of systems emerges uh, after you look at how you accomplish everything that you have to across an effects chain. You know, the find, fix, target, track, engage, and assess chain is is one of them. But there's plenty of logistical chains and others. And so, you know, I, if if technology was at the point where you could just make one system that could do all of that in in some package like a platform like the Death Star or something, then maybe you'd want to do that. Maybe you wouldn't. Uh, when, but really it's about how do you pull these different pieces of it? How do you find something? How do you fix it? Does that all have to be on the same platform or can it be spread out and disaggregated across domains or across platforms? And what we found is that, as you might expect, uh, the most effective and efficient way to do it uh, is really to disaggregate those capabilities away from just being in one place. So it's really a question of where do you aggregate, where do you disaggregate, and how do you pull different pieces of, uh, of capability together uh, over time? I would say one criticism that we've faced, I, I like this uh, statement, I, I've used it a few times, so I, I guess I like it, you guys may not as much, but we always get criticized, or the Air Force typically gets criticized about thinking about families of systems and families of capabilities, saying, hey, you always think about families, but then you just end up fielding platforms. And, and my answer to that is, well, that, that's really not how we're operating right now uh, in Syria, let's say, right? So. Uh, some, some hay was made that it was a, a, an F-18 that shot down the Su-22 over Syria and why wasn't it the F-22s that got to do that? It doesn't matter from an airman's perspective. What matters is that network of capabilities was able to come together, uh, that F-22s that were there were able to quarterback, send forces where they needed to go to protect our troops on the ground. And wh whoever was a trigger puller, as long as that network is able to provide air superiority, that's what it's really about. Uh, so we always feel a family of systems and capabilities. It's just sometimes, like parts of my family, can be a little dysfunctional, uh, <laughs> and sometimes it works really well together, like uh, the, my family on, on our good days. Uh, could you talk a bit about the changing relationship uh, between survivability and stealth and how the Air Force is changing the way they think about each of those components and their relationship with each other in part uh, as a result of your, your efforts? Yeah, go ahead, Riddler. You've got great points on this. Okay, uh, so survivability, uh, there's lots of ways to survive. Uh, hi historically, um, it, it could have been, it was speed, you know, you increased uh, an aircraft's speed by 50 knots and you made it uh, more survivable, you also made it uh, more lethal. Uh, now I think it's uh, a lot more complex, uh, it can be speed, it can be altitude, it can be uh, stealth is another uh, thing that we added to the toolkit uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, electronic warfare is is a form of uh, stealth, if you will, or stealth is a, a part of electronic warfare. So uh, the the right cocktail or the right mix of of uh, capabilities are what will make something survivable uh, in the future. And uh, understanding that right cocktail based on the uh, projected uh, threat. Is, is what's necessary and then uh, be able to identify what technologies you have in your toolkit uh, to make things more survivable, whether it be a weapon or a data link or a platform. Yeah, the, uh, the, I think in the articles I uh, even mentioned that 
as a young F-16 pilot, a lieutenant, uh, many years ago, uh, in our tactics manual, it talked about one of the best ways to be able to survive was to decrease the number of adversaries that were out there messing with you. So there is a link that we often don't think about between survivability and lethality. I'll have a much better chance of surviving if I'm able to take those adversaries out at some point. And, and so it becomes really complex as you balance offensive and defensive attributes off each other. And that's what detailed planning uh, for any system or capability uh, or platform is going to get into. How do, you, how do you balance all those attributes? Very good. Now, as we look toward the future in the 2030 time frame, uh, and we're moving into a world that's more and more dominated by operations in uh, cyberspace uh, and in outer space, uh, is air superiority really going to be just as important in 2030 and beyond as it has been in the past? Uh, and aren't some of these other capabilities just as important, if not more so, as we move into future conflict? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, for, for this one. So I think um, you cannot think of one domain without thinking about others. And from an airman's perspective, we focus primarily on air and space, and then we look at how cyber uh, is a capability that infuses those domains as well. Um, so uh, you know, one of the things as we were briefing air superiority that we always said is you can't have space superiority without air superiority, and it may be that you can't have air superiority without space superiority uh, at some point in the future. There, there will be pockets and places where maybe that doesn't apply, but broadly speaking, if you look at that network of capabilities that we advocate for in Air Superiority 2030, there's a number of space-based capabilities that could, would apply in there, whether they're communications and data links or whether it's uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance capabilities, whatever it happens to be that feeds into this network. And if you don't have that feed, then getting the front end of the kill chain accomplished the very the, the most important piece of it to find and fix things that you need to go after to get air superiority, then the whole thing kind of breaks down. Inversely, if you think about space superiority, let's say that you had an anti-satellite capability that was residing somewhere uh, in the middle of an ocean. Uh, if you can't get air superiority over that uh, island or that rock or, or that piece of land, wherever it happens to be, uh, so that you can tackle uh, that anti-satellite capability and, and take it out uh, in the worst case, you know, with a kinetic <laughs> effect or a non-kinetic effect. If you don't have air superiority, you can't affect that on the, uh, on the ground and, and take care of it. And so you may not be able to have space superiority if you can't get air superiority over certain pieces of the, the globe uh, on the ground as well. So they're, they're highly interconnected, I think, in the 2030 time frame. Uh, and I think, again, it's that network and how it comes together that's going to be able to bring all of them together. And, and you'll make some trade-offs. You'll go, well, you know, I, I'm going to put a more, as a, as a Joint Force Commander, you might make a, a, a trade-off that says, you know, this space capability is really the most important thing to my network right now, and so I'm going to put all my air superiority forces in this network and concentrate on denying the adversary the ability to deny me space. Uh, or it might be a different uh, piece that's more important. Uh, because you have ground forces that are operating and you don't want them to be struck by the adversary's uh, capabilities either. So, you know, that's, that's a, when you, one thing that's useful that Riddler likes to point out is if you flip the equation around and you said, what if the adversary had air superiority at this time? What kind of freedom of action does that give them? Uh, it gives them the ability maybe to deny you cyberspace because they could go blow up wherever your cyber s operators are. Uh, we already talked about how they could deny you space if they had air superiority. They could also attack your forces on the ground, and we haven't let that happen since 1953, uh, and we don't intend to let it happen in 2030 either. Anything to add to that, Riddler or Bam Bam? I would just say, you know, going forward, it's important to have a multi-domain approach, and that includes the air domain uh, as well. And uh, and. The air domain is, is needed for not just uh, space, but uh, land. I mean, you can look uh, in Europe. If, if somebody was able to utilize the air domain and deny it from us, uh, our ground forces would be exposed, uh, sensors uh, on the ground, whether it was a radar looking for ballistic missiles or defending space, uh, would be exposed to adversary air. And so they're all interrelated, as the general said. If I could just ask one one question before maybe we throw it open to the audience. Whoop. That was water. I'll get that later. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is well, we're on the rocks, but it's a bit too early for me to be having whiskey in the morning anyway, uh, at least for a Monday. But um, I'd like to ask if we could draw back the curtain a little bit and uh, talk about what it's like to uh, run and be a part of a working group like this in terms of managing talent, navigating the bureaucracy, where some communities might be a little more amenable to what you're doing than others. 
Uh, and also I think the importance of having you know, civilian talent on the team as well as military talent. Because I think efforts like this are increasing, becoming increasingly important to how our services uh, and our joint force uh, innovates. Now that's a that's a really great question, Ryan. Um, so uh, you know we were the first ECCT that the Air Force had done, uh, and so there was no template for uh, how we were going to do this. Uh, I was very fortunate that we identified some uh, great folks to be on the team, uh, and uh, we had a, a very diverse set of folks that were kind of on a core team of about 10 to 12 people. It went up and down as assignments happened uh, during the course of the 15 months or so that we were uh, together. But that, that small core of 10 to 12 folks was not nearly sufficient to get after uh, all the issues that we had uh, that we needed to look at. We needed a core of uh, cyber and space expertise that wasn't really resident here in the D.C. area where kind of the center of gravity of our work was. And so we had to reach out to uh, Air Force Space Command. We had to go down to San Antonio where a lot of our cyber capabilities are and really reach out to a much broader group. I'd say over, over the life of the ECCT, you know, several hundred people across the Air Force participated, uh, bringing all sorts of different diverse opinions and, and, uh, and, and viewpoints to it. And it was, uh, it was not, uh, you know, it was not just operators. There were logisticians that participated so they could look at what are the logistical impacts of what we're coming up with. Uh, there were intelligence professionals who looked at how would we meet the intelligence requirements, uh, a whole host of uh, different Air Force specialties that uh, came together. Uh, so leading a diverse team like that, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is to come up with a shared vision. And one thing that uh, airmen do share a vision about uh, is making sure that we can accomplish our core missions. You know, we're a can-do service that's going to go out there and get it done, whether it's uh, putting up RPA caps because people want full motion video uh, in the uh, Middle East or, or uh, whether it's uh, making sure that GPS is operating on a daily basis. Whatever it is, the Air Force is going to get it done. Uh, and so when you bring people together and you say, hey, look, this is the mission of the Air Force, a mission of the Air Force, not Air Combat Command or some piece of it, is air superiority. And Air Force Space Command has that mission. Air Force Cyber Forces have that mission. Uh, Air Force Intel uh, Forces have that mission. All of us have that mission and we share in it. Uh, then, you know, airmen can just kind of get that, that kind of work done. Uh, importantly, it wasn't just airmen. So we did reach out to Army and Navy counterparts. We had a great, robust dialogue across the joint services, both in understanding what their requirements were from us, uh, as well as how uh, we could uh, ensure that we provided them the, the cover that air superiority does. The, I mean, air superiority uh, underwrites so much of what we do. If you think about all the ISR that goes on uh, downrange on a daily basis, you think about uh, cargo resupply happening, you think about uh, being able to, for the, to get the Afghan Air Force up to the level where it is, none of that's possible without air superiority. Um, and so uh, across the board, it was just a great team that came together. I'll let Bam Bam talk a little bit about the uh, bringing in some civilian expertise because that was absolutely key as well. So analytically, when you, when you think on an endeavor like this, you go, okay, you know, evaluate the entirety of air superiority. Uh, you know, in the course of a year, you have a very limited amount of time and you have a deadline to get it at the very end. And to an analyst, that's, I, that's almost impossible to do all that just, you know, from your own little shop or whatever, whatever place you are at. But uh, the opportunity here with this enterprise approach was a fantastic opportunity to open up the aperture, be able to bring in a lot of experts. So we had access to, uh, to the experts of the Air Force, the Air Force 89 studies and analysis. We had those folks there. We had folks out of the Air Force Research Laboratories, the folks at AFL-CMC. Uh, bringing their analytic power, but not only the Air Force analysts we brought together, we also had folks from MIT, Lincoln Labs, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, our partners in industry provided a lot of great uh, analytic work that they've done over the course of the year. When you've opened up the, uh, the analytic uh, lens to be able to, to hoover in all of that information, to be able to help focus what we need to do and provide a, a level of knowledge creation for the core team that Grinch was talking about that uh, allowed us to basically O open up that aperture to you know non-fighter pilots and folks that that really think about the tough difficult problems that we face uh, in in a very detailed and analytic approach to it that was a, a fantastic opportunity to use the uh, the authority that the chief gave us to be able to bring all that information together to be able to better inform to, uh, the team and then be able to better inform the, uh, the chief for moving forward Thank okay, you. very good. One more question from up front here, and then we'll open it up uh, to the crowd. Um, one of the things that is discussed in the report is this whole notion of uh, penetrating counter air. Uh, and some people are scratching their uh, craniums about why are we talking about another 
uh, aircraft when we haven't even uh, finished uh, uh, the full fielding of uh, F-35. Could you comment a bit on uh, PCA and what it means? Sure, I'll start and then uh, uh, Riddler can probably provide a little bit more uh, insight as well. So I, I guess I go back to it's, it's all about that network and how you accomplish an effects chain. Uh, and as you look at the pieces of the network, so we, we went into this wide open and said, you know, if there's a way that we can do air superiority uh, with just space forces or just cyber space forces, we want to fully develop those out as courses of action that we can weigh. Uh, and if there's a way that we could do it passively, let's say that uh, you, you know, an F-117 over Baghdad in 1991, I would argue, uh, had air superiority uh, for its little bubble, right? No, nothing could affect it. It had freedom of action, freedom to maneuver uh, in that space. If there was a way to, to build that on a, on a larger scale where you could project air superiority without, uh, without having to instantiate some other capabilities to go along with it, then, then we were all for it. Uh, what we found is we went through a number of different conceptual frameworks. Uh, we had, you know, standoff and stand-in. We had uh, various instantiations of where that point of autonomy was that uh, we spoke about. Uh, what we found is that there were certain gaps, and the biggest gap was in kind of that find and fix capability at the front end of the kill chain. Uh, so where the concept of a penetrating counter air capability came from is, is really think of it more of, as a node in a network than as a fighter or as a replacement for the F-22 or F-35. It's really, it's really not a replacement for those. It's a, a, a distinct capability uh, that I would argue is going to provide a key node in that network to help find and fix. And since it's there, it may as well complete some of the kill chain some of the time uh, to, uh, to, to kill uh, whatever is there. Uh, or engage it in whatever manner uh, seems appropriate. So that node in the network could be used for kinetic effects, it could be used for non-kinetic effects, or any number of things. Uh, so there's been a lot of focus on it, but again, I think you have to put it in the context of that broad air, space, and cyber-enabled network uh, in order to really understand why it's important. It's, it is an important piece of it, I won't, I won't downplay it, uh, but that doesn't mean it's any more important or less important uh, than some other things that we came up with. A great example to go back to logistics, uh, you could, you know, you could build all the great things that, uh, you know, have wings and take off and land that you want, uh, but if you can't get them off the ground because you haven't thought through the logistical piece of it or how a base is going to operate it uh, in a, a more contested environment, uh, then that capability doesn't really exist. It's just, uh, it's just in your imagination. So I'll let Riddler uh, fill in a little bit as well on PCA. I, I look at PCA as it, it's a capability. It, it's a necessary capability, but it's it's uh, just one portion of a, of a family of capabilities, and uh, um, so, so it's it's more than it's larger than PCA. Uh,